Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome to another episode of the COVID Conversations. I'm coming to you somewhat live from my backyard in a somewhat isolation. This is a conversation um, with some people that I hold near and dear to me, some new friends, some old friends, some medium length friends. Um, my name's Kyle Reber and all these conversations are on my YouTube channel, which is very hard to remember. It's K-Y-L-R-E-B-E-R. -E -E yes, that's right. It's K-Y-L. No, there's no E. Yes, that's my real name. Um, with me to my left or right, or however you see it, is a, uh, a woman who um, I have met recently over the last probably 12 months. Um, I know her, uh, her partner very well, and I miss giving him a little bit of a cuddle at Jiu-Jitsu, but enough about him. Let's talk about her. <laughs> Emily Shine, welcome, and thank you for joining me. Uh, thank you for having me here. Now, um, Emily is a, uh, this is going to be an interesting one. Um, no pressure, Em. Um, <laughs> Emily is uh, a kinesiologist and a spiritual health mentor, I guess you would say. Um, and she's been doing that for the last 12 years. So I'm really interested to... Um, hear the barbecue intro and we'll um we'll feed more into that but um as you can understand emily would be very affected by what's going on at the moment um but having said that she's also a mother she's also a partner so it's a broad scale thing and we'll try to fit everything we can into the next 40 odd minutes but let's get into it um it's it's 10 10 30 in the morning so it's a little bit too early so i've got my water bottle G'day, my name's Kyle. What's your name and what are you doing here? What do you do? Hi, Emily. My, name, my name's Emily Shine. Uh, what am I doing here? Well, I'm here because you've invited me on, <laughs> <laughs> but also because I really love to spread awareness about what I do. Um, I really work alongside a lot of people who, for lack of better words, live in the um, Sorry, one second. Somebody's trying yeah, to me because that's perfect, perfect timing. <laughs> Everything, all, all imperfect is perfect, right? Not the first time um, it happened on here. No. <laughs> <Keep going. laughs> I really work in the paradigm of a lot of people, for lack of better words, who are very mainstream and, um, you know, quite unaware of what spiritual development means to them and also what kinesiology is. And I love to blend the very scientific based uh Eastern medicine with Western medicine, and we'll talk more about how that, how my background allows me to integrate those things with being able to reconnect people in with themselves. And when I talk about spiritual development or spiritual health, when it comes to spirituality, my perception of spirituality is just the self. So it's really just self development because spirituality is very different for every individual person, and there is actually no right or wrong. It's not. Uh, it's not like the same paradigm as different religions where we are given a set of rules and circumstances of which we need to believe. It's more of a, what am I, who am I externally to my body, externally to this lump of flesh that we're walking around in. So I guess having said all of that, I walk up to you and I introduce myself and you introduce yourself. I say, I do this and you say, you do that. It's not something that you commonly would encounter and it's not something like you know someone says oh yeah i'm an electrician yeah cool awesome but you do that is there often where you'll start to talk to people you don't know do they sort of take that step back and go right like how does how does that get i mean we're, we're proud of what we do and you're very good at what we do what you do but is it something that yeah it's not every day someone you know you have that conversation with someone that they say they do the sort of work that you do yeah, absolutely. It is a conversation starter every single time, <laughs> which is part of the thing that I love the most about it. Because even if people walk away thinking it's a load of garbage or thinking I'm a little bit strange, it's still the opportunity to plant a seed in somebody's brain that there is other things out there that could potentially help them. And the people who will find their way to that modality or find their way to being able to um, receive help from those those paradigms of, of, of life, they're meant to. And the people who walk away with no the intention of ever going down that track they're not they're not meant to so yeah. a part of what i'm what i do is is kind of accepting everything and everyone for exactly the way it is and yeah. at first 
it was really daunting to have to say that in groups of people to say, you know, this is what I do. At first it was scary. Um, but after years of doing it and, and, and really building that relationship around being all accepting of where everyone is at in their journey, you begin to not worry about that anymore. And it becomes almost like a bit of a game that you play in your own brain as to, I wonder how this person's going to react yeah. to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like um i'm sure you've maybe over time worked out your little little words to abbreviate or something like that or if you probably had my sense of humor you'd every now and then just you know just say something just completely out of the box and just see how they react to it but i'm really curious this is not a job if, if that's what you want to call it this is not a job that you apply for on seek or you go I'm, I'm going to finish school. Uh, what do you want to do when you leave school? I want to become a kinesiologist and a spiritual holistic health worker, blah, 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 healer. How does one become one of this? Where do you, where does this, how did you get to where you are in the uh, broad sense of it all? Yeah, so it was a bit of a journey for me. I grew up in a really, um, I guess, uh, I can't think of the like open-minded, I suppose, um, family. And so my grandfather was a hypnotherapist and my, and a psychotherapist and my mum was a hypnotherapist. So it was really quite new agey and very well accepted to, you know, look into those, those areas of life. Um, I was very unwell as a child and time and time again, I would have these really weird symptoms and really weird, um, illnesses which modern medicine didn't seem to be able to uh, support me in. And so time and time again, I would end up in a naturopathic office um, with a naturopath giving me herbs or, you know, adjusting my diet to exclude food sensitivities, which is now becoming a lot more commonly used even in Western medicine. But back That's then... Right it wasn't recognized. Nutrition was definitely not recognized barely at all um, within modern medicine. So doctors at, at, when I was young, only needed to complete one module of nutrition in order to be a doctor. So when you turn up with gut health issues and, you know, crazy um, allergies, eczema, all that kind of stuff, they just go to cortisones and, um, you know, steroids and things like that to, to mask the symptoms. They don't look at why it's happening in the first place. So this is kind of the basis of my knowledge around natural medicine is I had a lot of these things that spot like came up for me as I was as I was growing up and natural medicine supported me every single time because they were not acute illnesses like what you can put into a black and white bracket it mm. wasn't like I had something like you know type 1 diabetes where I could show up to a doctor and they're like you have type 1 diabetes here's some insulin that's it see you later they were things that were caused by foods and stress and all these kind of you know over time things so when I left school, I actually worked in a uh, chiropractor's office and um, chiropractic introduced me to the innate awareness of the body and into the nervous system of the body. And chiropractors often support their bodies with supplements as well. So this kind of started the cogs turning when it came to uh, natural health and how I can implement that. At the same time, I was working it as an intuitive, like that was something that I had already, already knew I could do. So I was, you know, and for, I don't like the term psychic, but people like the, that word because they know what it means. But I well, always it's something, had, it's a broader, I guess it's a broader definition. And when you say that, we sort of because I would the next thing I would say is what 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 does an intuitive do that's different to a psyche yeah so and and I can explain that um the reason why I don't like the term psychic is that psychic says that I can tell you what's going to happen to you whereas mm. I believe that you have the universal law of free will which means that you get to manifest and create the reality that you choose to live so mm -hmm. being an intuitive you can actually pick up what areas of people's lives they might be blocking themselves and then give them an understanding of an outcome that may actually happen if they don't shift into that space so it's like like saying to someone you're going to get into a car accident if they walk out of your office and never get into a car again well then they're not going to get into a car accident are they mm -hmm. so you can actually change the outcome so i don't like the word psychic because of that reason you can still pick up very clearly if things are going to happen but you still, the client still has the ability to change the outcome of that and that's why they're getting the guidance in the first place so intuitive is a much better term for it because you're basically yeah. just getting guidance channel to you from a higher source of energy. So I started doing that at the age, well, I've, I'd always had very keen intuitive insight. I was telling people things were going to happen at like 11 years old and they would come through. And mm. I've actually noticed that in my son now as well. 
who's a very mainstream kind of kid and not very, you know, into anything um, woo woo, so to speak, but um, he will wake up and say, I had a dream that this is going to happen and then it will happen. So he's got that as well. So would you say this is something that I'm trying not to get a little bit too spiritual here, but maybe is this something that it, it, it's a genetic thing? Like it is a thing that's passed down? Like that's a really interesting question. So this is what I tell people when it comes to intuition. Like there is no... Wake up, sorry, I was gonna, you don't wake up one day and just decide you maybe are going to do this. This is like you said, from 11 years old and you're, well, I won't give your age away, but you're not 11 anymore. So it's something that's it's always been there. It's just a case of chipping away the layers and finding out that it's really there to do. So this is the perception and it's actually a misconception. So I explain intuition is like a run, like running. Okay. Yeah. So you've got people who are born fantastic runners. They're naturally great at running. But yeah. if you wake up one day and say, I really want to start running and you run every single day, at first it's going to feel really foreign and it's going to be really hard for you to do. But if you continue to run, you will get faster. You will have higher endurance and you will start to be able to operate running in a, in a deeper capacity. So mm. every single person has intuition within their body. It's actually our inner GPS system and everybody has it. My understanding is that intuition can come to people for two different reasons from a, from birth. Like you can have an open vessel from birth for two different reasons. One is that sometimes when people go through trauma, it's an innate gift that kind of activates in order for them to be able to perceive a future ahead. It kind of like a coping mechanism. Yeah. Two is that they have something on their life path or their journey that's going to require them to be very open and receptive to their intuition. Okay. But you can actually learn to open your intuition. And I have actually trained, I have one of my clients was a police officer and she came to me for a reading one day and I told her all this stuff about herself. And then she was like, I really want to do more of this. Can I learn it? She is now one of the best intuitives that I know. And she started yeah. from a very close space and trained herself and practiced with you know practiced her art of intuition over years created a trust with herself and now she is really really great at what she does and um, that was a massive shift for her coming from such a black and white industry to something that's really energetic yeah, that's so really... I started I started doing the intuitive stuff at 19 professionally um, and that was kind of the start of my own business whilst always also working in chiropractic and then later moving into pharmaceuticals or um, mm. managing pharmacies which I managed pharmacies right the way throughout starting my kinesiology career and everything like that, which gave me a really good insight into Western medicine and how it all operates. Um, and also it trained me on, on vitamins and supplements. I became a vitamins consultant. I trained with Blackmores and Nature's Own and some of the big vitamin brands that we see on our shelves today. Yeah. And so I got to a point where I was like, how do I integrate all of these things? How can I take the energetic stuff and the Western medicine stuff and the nutritional stuff and put them into one holistic modality because I see this, the, the body as being 360 degrees, not just a two-dimensional thing. So I don't just see the body as skin and bones. I see it as skin and bones, it metabolism and digestive system and energetic system and all these different systems integrating with each other. So how do I figure out where the stress is lying in all of those different layers? Is it an emotional stress? Is it a, is it a, a nutritional stress, stress? Is it an energetic stress? How do I identify where the stress is and what the body needs in order to rectify that stress? And then I stumbled across, or the universe, in my opinion, <laughs> presented me with... I know, everything's <laughs> for a reason. This is all happened for a reason. Yep. Uh, kinesiology as a modality. So I actually had started a... Um, I'd had my son and I'd started a mother's group for natural minded parents because I was very natural minded. And back then we're talking 10 years ago, wasn't, it was still really weird for people to be not into using chemicals in their house and all that kind of stuff. And I was introduced to a lady who did kinesiology and I actually, as a, another part of my backstory suffered very severely for a lot of years with anxiety, with like a crippling anxiety disorder to the point where I wouldn't leave the house and all sorts of things. And so she asked me to come along and try kinesiology kinesiology for myself um, to help with my anxiety. And it was after having lived with that for probably close to 15 years by that stage, I, it was the first thing that touched the sides for me when it came to resolving my anxiety. So um, it was from that moment on that I knew what I needed to do with it. And I studied kinesiology and now I just integrate it all into one. And I also help mentor people from a psychological perspective, especially within their businesses too. So that's that spiritual development. 
So you run, um, you run trips and that's all. Retreats. Yeah. Retreats, Retreats, workshops, um, women's circles. I started running women's circles about eight years ago and I really wanted just to create a space of safety, I suppose, for women who were interested in this sort of stuff. Because again, eight years ago, it wasn't as fashionable as it is today and it wasn't as accepted. So it was just a conversation. Um, But now I'm really moving into a space of, uh, I I work with circles more so on a mixed gender point of view. So I have both men and women in circle. And a circle is basically just a safe space to take off your social mask and be yourself and talk about what's going on for you. And I'm really hoping that my beautiful man, (laughs) uh, Julian, will actually take the lead on being able to um, help men to be able to open up and communicate their feelings because it's something they need so much at the moment yeah very much so and that sort of is another question i was thinking of just as you were saying your retreats is is this something that like on a broad scale you think women are more naturally attracted to but you are seeing a shift that men are now starting to go i i think this may actually carry a bit of weight a hundred percent. So my retreats are still women only at this point. I'm doing circles with both men and women, but I would love to be able to open that up. It's definitely on the cards. Um, may not be this year now that COVID's kind of put a spanner in the works, but uh, it was really on the cards for this year to have a co-ed retreat. Um, and my partner just recently went to a men's retreat and it changed his life. So it's yeah. just that it's more commonly accepted, I think, when it comes to um, women attending these sorts of things than it is for men. Um, I just don't think we're as used to hearing I'm going on a retreat coming from a men's uh, point of view, which is really sad because they are retreat containers, are just an amplified container with amplified support in order for you mm. to dig through your stuff and then go home with a fresh perspective in order to work through. And I think, um, like you said, once COVID is over, and um, I think definitely... Maybe, well, not to say a good thing, but maybe a market will increase out of COVID of men having to go, all right, I need to unpack, as the term is, and um, go and do a bit of this stuff. Because I know, talking to Julian when he went on his retreat, how much it just basically, I guess, opened Pandora's box a little bit. So I think it is very credible because, yeah, us blokes are shit at talking about our feelings at the best of times. Um, we're getting better, but um, it's definitely something that I think yeah, you will very much find a market on in uh, probably the coming coming couple of years in particular. Yeah. What um, so what Emily Shine is something that you're passionate about? So obviously there's the given stuff, which is really just helping people. Like people are my biggest passion. And, and whenever I see, you know, moments of disharmony within people's lives or in their surroundings, my passion gets sparked up. I'm like, oh my gosh, let's, let's work through this. Let's make your life easier to live. And that really comes again from a basis of having a really rough upbringing and, and having a lot of health and um, both physical and mental health problems as a young kid. And I'm one of those people that did everything very early and got it all done so I, I got married I got divorced I had kids I you know, like I had all these things I want to get this shit was, out of the way <laughs> yeah exactly by the time I was 25 I had basically done all things and then I was ready to like shift into this all right now I've experienced all that garbage let me help yeah, others go that. through their stuff which is all divine and it was all like perfect and I'm glad that my life went that way because I have the tools now to be able to you know, support others in those situations from a pretty young age too. Like I'm not a woman in my forties yet um, having to only just start doing what I'm doing because I've only just gathered that life experience. Like I've been through it all very early on. So that's obviously my big passion, but I've got lots of side passions as well. I'm really creative. I love photography. Photography is probably one of my um, main passions. I've actually just started it up as a little bit of a side business, which is something that I've been reluctant to do for a long time because of this limiting belief pattern that you can't be two things. So people knowing me in the community is, is this, um, are they going to take the fact that I'm doing photography seriously? And so there was a bit of, I think, time spent in COVID has allowed me to go a bit introverted and, yeah. and ask myself what, what lights me up. And the fact of the matter is I, my answer was that I would do photography for free. So, um, cause I love it so much. So that was enough reason for me to really start a little side gig doing that. So that's something I'm really passionate about. And also I love jujitsu. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> which is again a really wild thing for someone who stay. is kind of <laughs> he can stay he's a keeper <laughs> yeah so someone who's kind of soft and gentle and spends their life kind of holding people and their stuff will then like kind of revert into this space of like choking someone out which is really <laughs> such a big paradox oh but yeah balanced. i told you I mean, I told you in the podcast that I did with you a little while ago that jujitsu loosely translated means the gentle laugh. Yeah. So that's, yeah. Just use that and get away with it. Do yeah. You, <laughs> I'll, I'll lean towards the jujitsu because I like talking about jujitsu. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Do you find that is a... Because um, one question I was going to ask you and the photography sort of helps me do that too. Do you find it's a it's a good thing for people because in this passionate question, people have wanted to obviously like your passion is the kinesiology, the holistic stuff and everything, but it's also your job. So yeah. it's very hard sometimes to say your job is still your passion and your passion is your job because you need something to, to switch off from. Yeah. Do you find the photography and it, you know in particular the jujitsu? It's a thing where I can go in here. And no one's going to ask me to read their, you know, sorry to sound uneducated. No one's going to ask me to read my palm or have a look at my face. And is this here? And am I going to, uh, am I going to win, win gold lotto next weekend or something like that? I can just go in here. I can be Emily. I can wrestle the shit out of someone, choke the hell out of someone, hopefully not die and go back and go back to my normal day. Do you think it's yeah. good for people to have that sort of stuff, especially at the moment? A hundred percent. So um, in my profession, I am asked every day to hold people in their staff. So they are there, they're expressing what's like, you know, affecting them deeply. They're outlaying emotions, which is very similar to people who are in lots of other helping positions like nurses or carers or psychologists or anybody, even um, teachers, hairdressers are a big one for this. People come and they, they talk about their stuff and you have to respond as a practitioner or even I would say you would get that a bit in, um, yeah. in, in being a coach and a mentor in that position as well. Definitely. Um, and you have to stand as that pillar of strength and be able to respond accordingly and without sounding, um, you know, like uh, unempathetic, like there are the most of the time you, you want to sit there and you want to do these things and you genuinely want to hold them. But there are some days where you just don't want to hear it. You just don't want to hear anybody else's bullshit because you've got your own bullshit. And so going into another space where you can find passionate, where it's just, you show up, you do what you do, and then you go home is so refreshing. So you show up to jujitsu, you wrestle, you get all your frustration out, and then you go home. Perfect. You show up to a photo shoot, you take some pretty pictures. It's cut dry. Like there's no shades of gray. Yeah. There's no having to, you know, talk people through their emotional stuff. And um, it just lets you be there just for you. So yeah, a hundred percent. Cause I know um, Helen would, um, confirm this i will come home from training some nights and i will just sit on the couch and just look like a zombie because you've spent x amount of hours and again we're not being unempathetic um unempathetic it's it's just it's an it's a byproduct of what we do you would just sit down on the couch and julian and might want to start having a conversation you just go don't talk to me i am i'm am <laughs> done i am done for the day Please yeah <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I love the saying, you can't pour from an empty cup. So mm. it's our responsibility as practitioners to make sure that we are filling our own cup up with whatever it is that we need in order to, you know, show up every single day to our clients and be the best version of ourselves for them. Because if we don't do it, then we show up to them like zombies and they're paying us for a service and we're not delivering essentially. So my self-care is actually my most highest um, priority above, and, and this might sound really harsh, but I put my self-care now above my own children's needs because if I don't look after myself, I cannot show up as a mum who actually can have patience and be attentive and give them everything that they need because I don't have any energy. I'm the zombie. And mothers all cringe at that thought. They're like, no, children have to come first. But it's like when you're in a plane and they say, put your oxygen on first. Don't put your child's oxygen on first. Put yours on first because you can't help your child if you're yeah. dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's it's a very it's a very good point and i was interviewing someone else recently and they were <clears throat> talking about by doing that it enables you to keep conducting the passion in what you do yeah. so it's it's that age-old thing like yeah we have to look after ourselves more and again you would be a lot of parents and you would encounter a lot of women that you work with are also parents 
And I'm sure you see it so many times, ask about face, and that could be one of the main reasons that they come to see you because it's just become so skewed that it's, it's at the breaking point. Yeah, burnout is a big issue, especially um, when it comes to mums. Mums, yeah, they tend to put their partners first or their husbands first, their children first, their jobs first, the house first then they look after themselves. Um, and, and men do it too. They do it in a different capacity, but, but women tend to be yeah, very um, self-sacrificial, uh, for sure. We'll get onto that later. One more question I want to ask before we move on. I would walk past, and then I love asking people this question because I'll, I'll relate this a little bit back to martial arts. I would walk past you in the street, see you, and if it came up again in a barbecue intro, what sport do you play? And you would say jiu-jitsu. I would go, no, really, what, what sport do you play? <laughs> Why, how does that come to be? I love hearing people's how, I love hearing, like I said, you, know, you, don't, you didn't fall into this occupation, you do. But I love hearing how people came to be. How does jiu-jitsu come to be for Emily? So um, I've always really been drawn to combat sports. I found it the one thing that allows me to release stress. I'm actually notoriously terrible at sports. Um, I'm ne <laughs> I've never been athletic. Just being I'm humble. Very, <laughs> I'm very, well, I'm very good at a lot of things and I'm one of those people that have lots of talents and it's like annoyingly so, but I am I terrible suck. when it comes to sports. <laughs> I suck at sports, I really, really do. Um, but, and so I think it's because I've got this terrible kind of hand-eye coordination issue and I'm not super fit. Um, but I, so I used to do a little bit of Muay Thai um, after I had my son at a gym that I was going to. I kind of got involved in the classes that were, they were running and I was like, this is actually something I love because I'm just kind of like, I'm hitting things, I'm kicking things. And this is like releasing my stress. And it didn't really matter that I was terrible at it because... I was actually just being able to move that energy through my body and movement exactly. is such a effective way of, of moving energy. Um, so that's kind of where my, my love for combat sport really started. And then I started doing boxing and I loved that because it was the same sort of concept. And then I met my beautiful partner, Jules and uh, Jules has been training with Kyle for, you know, God, 10 years or something like that. <laughs> yeah, you we've guys been He's been on and off for God knows how long. <laughs> yeah, a long time. So Jules and I have been together for about four years ago, uh, four years now. So it was only about, two years ago that he got back into jujitsu and um, he started telling me about how fun it was and how, you know, women really benefit from jujitsu so much and all the concepts of that. And then I, I also had just signed up at a gym who was offering a once a week jujitsu class. And Jill said, why don't you just try it? Because everyone in the jujitsu community or people that do jujitsu are just super welcoming and you'll never feel like an idiot. You won't feel like you're out of place. Like they will really take you under their wing and look after you and you've got nothing to lose. It's already included in your gym membership. Just try it. So I did, I went along by myself and I did this one class and the instructor was amazing and the people were so friendly and um, he taught me the triangle <laughs> on my first, <laughs> my first session and he was Serbian. He was like, you know, a terrible accent, but a terrible <laughs> Serbian accent. But he was like, you know, if you never come back, I teach you one move and you will be able to protect yourself for life. And I was like, okay, this sounds great. And by the end of it, I was throwing this 120 kilo Kiwi guy, this gentle giant. I was throwing him off me and like getting away. And I'm like, this is so empowering. And, um, you know, I, I, I was a, a victim of um, domestic violence earlier on in my life and sexual abuse. And even though I had healed from the, I guess, emotional ramifications of that knowing that I could protect myself from that ever happening again was like the closure that I needed to move forward and this is something that I bring to my clients and I bring to women who come to see me who have experienced the same sort of thing I'm like please go and try jujitsu because you will learn the basic tools that you need to protect yourself but you will also gain that empowerment to be able to know that it's not going to happen again mm. because it's all practiced on the floor, which is where you're going to go if you're being abused. It's funny, isn't it? Because I, um, I, I, like I said to you, I often love seeing people's progression and seeing how it ends up and where it comes to be. And I think I said to you in our podcast, jujitsu is one that, and again, all martial arts, I think people have a misconception of what a martial artist is or what a fighter is. And I also said, like, everybody's a fighter to some degree. You know, 
a person recovering from cancer, they're a fighter. A person who's in a violent relationship trying to get out, they're a fighter. But like jujitsu does help you learn how to fight and it's a very manageable martial art. Dare I say, you don't get hurt too much. And above all, like you said, for females, it is incredibly empowering. Maybe yeah. that's something down the track in your retreats. We can do some jujitsu classes as well. Yeah, you know? I've actually, I have actually, uh, it hasn't been the first time that I've actually wanted to bring in some kind of self-defense into my women's retreats. It was originally the first ever retreat I held was a really large scale. It had 32 women there. Yeah, and right. wow. yeah, and uh, we had planned, I had a boxing instructor come well i had had planned her to come to do to teach self-defense and to teach um you know boxing as self-defense for these women but the mistake that i made in my naivety at this at the time was making it optional and women don't feel comfortable about it because they don't know what they're getting into so no one signed up for it so i would love to readdress that one day and actually just make it a part of the exercises that we do because once people are actually in it like a lot of exercises that are foreign to people they realize that they're really beneficial yeah, like you said, they just get that little nudge and the rest is history. Yeah. That's good, man. Really good. Now, um, I'll be nice to you so you don't kick my ass anymore. What's, um, <laughs> what's, what's on the bucket list? So I would professionally, the bucket list for me is I would love to speak in front of an audience of over 5,000 people. So for me to be able to impact that many people at once, that's like my professional bucket list. And I don't know whether that looks like a TED talk or some kind of presentation, but I would love to do that one day. Mm -hmm. um, and personally, as I said earlier, I struggled with anxiety for, for most of my life. And it really, really, really um, affected my ability to get out of my comfort zone. So that was mainly around travel. So up until last year, my bucket list was to go to Europe. And so that was my biggest fear growing up was actually, I'd have nightmares of being on a plane, waking up and being on a plane sent to Europe because it's so far away. Oh. But I actually conquered that last year. So I've now gone to Europe, loved it. So my next kind of bucket list thing would be to hike a mountain in a foreign country because that's wow. quite remote and really outside of my comfort zone. And I would love to be able to I'd basically be able to say to young Emily who was struggling with anxiety and for those people who have had those sorts of anxiety issues, we know that that seems like it's completely irreachable. I'd love to be able to say to younger Emily, you can do that. So that's my next thing. It's funny because that's, Two things there. That's one of the questions that um, I was going, I'm working on. Like at some point I will revise these questions. And one question that I will maybe revise in there is what lessons or what would you say to your younger self? Yeah. And I think that's, that's a really interesting thing because, yeah, we just don't dictate where we're going to end up. But somebody um, like you would have, you know, like you would have a lot of time talking to people and where they're at in life and what, what they feel on that. When I use the term bucket list, do you, and when you were working out bucket list, do you put it up down as a bucket list, something that seems really hard, but it is going to be at some point achievable? Is that, what do you define yeah. a bucket list as? Because it's funny, a lot of people said, um, I had a kid I was talking to about bucket list and he goes, I want to do some skydiving. And I said, to me, that's, it's a bucket list because you've got to conquer some fears and that sort of thing to get onto the plane. But financially, I could, I'll could, i pay for that and you can do that tomorrow if you really wanted to. So that part's not hard, but this part might be hard, the actual getting on and jumping out of a perfectly good aeroplane. But what do you see as a bucket list? You know, if you were talking Yeah, well... I guess, I guess for me, a bucket list is anything that you want to achieve before you kick the bucket. So it could be something that's quite small and achievable um, if it's really what's on your heart in order for you to be able to achieve that, to find some place of, of enlightenment. Actually, Julie and I were talking about this concept last mm -hmm. night. We were, we've, we've decided that we wouldn't watch TV at night and instead we'd go to bed early and read. Um, so we, we both read side by side and we're both reading, you know, self-help stuff and like stopping midway through and conversing with each other about this. And um, we were talking about intrinsic goals and extrinsic goals. And so what we need to, um, you know, what we need to achieve within ourselves being so much more important to what we need to achieve externally to ourselves, because when we focus on things that are being, um, that we are achieving externally to ourselves, 
then they don't actually speak to our heart. And the book that he was reading, um, which is called Lost Connections, which is an amazing book about, um, yeah, yeah, so um, So, about... um, Ari, um, just on a side note, if you are wanting to really read some deep stuff about basically the uh, opposite of addiction is connection, read that book. Keep yeah, going. really yeah. great book by this. I haven't read it myself, but I've kind of been reading it alongside Jules because he'll stop every two minutes and tell mm-hmm. me more about it. And I, at the same time, was reading an astrology book which was talking about the same sort of thing with the quest for enlightenment within ourselves. And and so sometimes the quest for enlightenment or an extrinsic goal can hold some kind of key to something intrinsically. And for me, that's what a bucket list should maintain. So for me, you know, hiking a mountain, for every other person, it could just be a matter of booking a ticket and going which doesn't sound to me what you should be putting on your bucket list but for me it's an in, a, extrinsic goal which actually speaks to an intrinsic part of me that Definitely. says you have conquered a fear so yeah. does that make sense no totally and this is why when you know you might talk to somebody about a bucket list and again our bucket lists are all our own but you know someone might say i want to i want to make a million dollars And you go, okay, you can make that million dollars. You can have all that money. But what is that, like you said, what is that fixed in here? How? So when you make that million dollars and nothing seems to change, what what happens then? What do you do then? Whereas you climb that mountain and you go, you're standing like, to me, it's when you do that bucket list, whatever it is, and you have that moment, and I've said this to a few people, when like for you, you're standing up on the top of that mountain or in front of that crowd of 5,000 people. And for just that one or two seconds, you just look around and you just go, how fucking good is this? Yeah, I I did this, I've I've done it. I think the other thing about it is that I, if in black and white, I actually have zero um, interest or desire to climb a mountain um, overseas. I, I don't want to do it. I'm challenging myself to do it, to say that I can do it. And it's the same with the 5,000 people contrary to what people um, would expect from me being that I've done a lot of public speaking through my career and I'm not nervous to talk to people on podcasts and things like that. I'm actually terrified of public speaking. And every single time I get up in front of people, my whole body, my knees, everything shakes and you can't hide it. I can actually, I actually shake. So um, I, I will usually start my, my chats by saying, I'm really nervous. Just give me five minutes of talking and my knees will stop shaking. So just bear with me. And I call myself out. But to stand in front of 5,000 people, to me, that's an achievable amount of people. I'm not saying 100,000 people, but 5,000 people seems like an achievable, plausible amount of people to actually stand up and and conquer that fear of public speaking on a grand scale. So again, it's not about what you want because it'll be fun. It's about what I want to do in order to prove something to myself intrinsically. Yeah, I can do it. I've done it. Yeah. um, Yeah, that's a really interesting way of looking at it. So the uh, the final question, the current situation in the world, that little thing called COVID, um, how it's affecting you and what do you think we as a society will take away? Now, before you go, I want to come back to something you said earlier about burnout with mums. Are you, oh, what would you call it? Um, are you already seeing it or are you preparing yourself for a few of those based appointments or retreats once this all clears up? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to put it lightly, if there's any mums that listen to this, my advice to you now is just chill out. Don't take homeschooling so bloody seriously. <laughs> it's Hang on, not that important. It's going to be okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, definitely. But yes, I do. I do expect that to come through because a lot of women in today's society, like it's, it's old belief patterns that the man needs to be the provider and the woman needs to be the nurturer. Right. And we've really shifted as a society around that. But what women haven't really shifted is the ability to now do all of the things. So we've gone from women being at home, being the homemakers, with their providers kind of bringing home all of the financial security and they just need to look after the kids in the house to women now working, having jobs, having ambitions, having careers, which is amazing. Of course we deserve to have all of those things, but, but what we haven't, yeah, what we haven't shifted out of is our expectations on ourselves as women to then also do all of the other things too. So mm-hmm. we still have a, 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 a certain amount of in, in, 
inequality in our brains when it comes to um, sharing the load. So I think that's why I see more burnout in women than I do with men, unless it's coming from a space of men not being able to express their emotions and accumulating emotions over time and then having breakdowns. But it's a different kind of burnout. So I, I do expect that with COVID, I know lots of mums who are working from home and schooling, homeschooling their kids and, you know, looking after the house and all, they're doing all of it. And they're under so much pressure because, you know, when the kids go to school, that's their one break to be able to get on top of everything. And they're not having that. So they're having to do all things at once. It's funny when you talk about that and there's, um, you know, the kids go to school and people will have that whole Stay at, mom, stay at home mum theory of what they do in, in that six hours of, you know, you're just hanging around all day, you're not doing anything. When the kids go to school, they get to do whatever else they need to do, housework, shopping, home duties, whatever it else involves, maybe do a bit of work from home. Now, it's funny just having a couple of little humans at home, how much of a difference 24-7. Like my kids and I, we haven't, fought as much but there's just i'm saying the most commonly said word in the house at the moment is that 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 and there's just no flow and again it's it's probably a trivial problem but it's it's upset the routine of the house and it's just a case like you said with the homeschooling that we spoke about earlier they've just got to maybe uh hang on kind of enjoy the ride and no one's going to give a shit about the report card at the end of term two really are they yeah there's just so many different, um, there's so many different ways of schooling and teaching kids. And I'm actually not against homeschooling or even another term that gets thrown around, which is unschooling. I've looked into these modalities of, of teaching kids and I'm actually in full um, support of those ways of teaching children because every single child is different and has different needs and they learn differently. And sometimes the mainstream stream schooling systems don't support every single child. And I've definitely experienced that with my, my special needs kid. Um, however, the, the, the throwing into of um, having to homeschool when you're not prepared, when it's not your choice, when you don't, when you have a million other things on your plate and when you haven't got the support that you need in place to be able to homeschool your kids is really important. I've actually spoken to uh, friends of mine who homeschool their kids and they're like, this is a shock to us because on our daily basis, as you were saying before we started the um, podcast, it actually only takes about two hours a day to teach a child the curriculum. The rest of the stuff at the school is the filling in stuff, the social behavior, that, all that kind of stuff, right? So of a morning, homeschooling parents will school their kids for two hours and then they'll take them out and they'll do things and they'll socialize mm. with friends. We are not just homeschooling our kids. We have them confined in small spaces where they can't get out and do their normal routine. They can't interact with other kids or people and they're all going stir crazy. And that energy is amplifying and building and building and building. And depending on the kind of kids that you have, their adaptability may vary in that space as well. So it's very, it's a very difficult time for everyone, even people who typically homeschool their kids. And that's the thing. There's no, uh, there's no benchmark and there's no standard because it's essentially never been done before. Exactly. I, um, as a business, so we were talking about this also, I mean, you would obviously see clients face to face. You've now switched to Zooming and you're doing a bit of online stuff. Has that affected, or it obviously affects the way you do business, do you feel it's affected the quality of what you do or you're able to still do what you do effectively? So in some cases it has and in other cases it hasn't. So I do quite a few things, wear a few different hats within my business. One of my most favorite things to do in business is to hold group workshops, circles and retreats. Obviously that's something that I cannot do at the moment. Um, so I have had to shift to facilitating, you know, um, online group activities, which are still being really effective and have been so welcomed in a time like this. But at the same time, you know, we have a lot of, um, you know, practices that involve human connection, like eye gazing and, you know, holding of hands and, you know, all that really hippie la la stuff, which is actually really important to human to human connection and being uh, developing vulnerability and trust. So those things are a little bit 
um, hard to do when you're on an online platform. When it comes to face-to-face -face, uh, consultations with people, from an from a from a intuitive perspective, if I'm doing just something basic as a reading, it makes absolutely no difference at all. And in fact, I actually prefer it online because it means I don't have to set up a space or you know clear the space or anything like that. I can just um, tune in, do what I need to do, and tune out what I'm tapping into is um, universal energy. So it's available everywhere. You don't have to be face to face. If anyone ever tells you they're an intuitive, but they must be face to face with you, it's because they're not actually checking in with your intuition. They're just reading your body language. So yeah. I can literally pick up somebody's energy and stuff from one single en um, email, never seeing a picture of them, never knowing the backstory of them, nothing, and still have a fully accurate reading about what their life is um, going through at the moment and what they need to be aware of and um, what to expect. So I've just, it's... I've just gotten a little bit nervous. I'm trying to sit up straight now and just pay more attention. <laughs> it, <laughs> it, has to be, it has to be at the permission of the person. That's a part yeah. of energetic rules. So you can't just tap into someone's energy and find, up, uh, found out, find out all their stuff because their higher self has to be actually a part of that. So you're that talking to their higher self. Yeah. So it's like a conversation that you're having, but you're just having it in a, in a, in a more of a, a fifth dimensional space. So they mm. need to be a part of that conversation in order for it to come through. So that hasn't changed at all. Kinesiology is the interesting one. Um, you can do a kinesiology balance via distance. It's called surrogating. So essentially you're surrogating the body's energy or um, your client's body's energy for your own energy. So you can muscle test, which is the uh, modality that we use in kinesiology to connect the innate awareness of the body. You can muscle test your, your own body in relation to the client and get through um, information about emotional Phys uh, physiological, uh, nutritional, and spiritual um, blockages and stresses in the body, and then figure out what the body needs to rectify that. However, a part of kinesiology is um, musculoskeletal response. So there are people that come to see me who are purely coming because they've got a sore back or a sore neck or you know a trapped iliacus, and I can't really, unless it's an emotional um, mm -hmm. perspective, it's an emotional thing that's trapped there, I can't really release their muscles online, but I can do um, all of the other stuff. So it's just as effective in most ways, but for me, it's still, um, it doesn't feel as fluid because I really respond to person to person connection when it comes to kinesiology. I like having people there in person. So when I read about, I mean, and I, I give in every couple of days and read people's opinions on things and dare I say, I'd read that whole career mail thing and all the rest of it and give in. When I read demographers and psychologists or whatever say that this is going to change, one thing that's going to change out of this is our perception of touch and contact and we're going to be much more we're maybe hesitant in how much we shake hands, how much we hug and how much contact we have. Do you turn around and go, bitch, please, I am just aching. Like we need to... We need to get that back. We need to hold people's hands. We need to hug. Because like I said, I can, I can not articulate to you how I really feel, but I give you a hug and hold you so tight, I nearly crush your ribs. You pick up on probably a thousand different emotions all at once, don't you? You think that's yeah. bullshit? We need to be able to touch each other again? Um, touching, human touch or human interaction is paramount to human health. And it's been studied scientifically and proven time and time and time again that it is so important for mental health. They did that study. I, I wish I had the actual information at my fingertips, but it was a long time ago where they had babies that weren't given any social touch or interaction and the babies died from not having any touch. So wow. literally, literally, this is so important to human health. But in saying that, I actually fully agree with what they're saying is people are going to be more hesitant when it comes to touch and oh, being close and I said this to Jules and in, in the very start my partner Jules um, at the very start of all of this unrolling I, I just looked at him and I said there is going to be some major PTSD coming out of um, COVID-19 people are going to be experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder when it comes to leaving their homes we're probably yep. going to see a rise in agoraphobia we're going to see a rise in OCD we're going to see a rise in germophobia all of these things are going to be something that we're going to have to battle especially us as health practitioners, we're going to be working a lot more with these people to kind of break these barriers. But the funny thing is human touch and human interaction from that perspective has been um, distant for a little while. And that's actually part of what 
I do is trying to get people to open back up to it because it's so important and it actually can heal our bodies just to be connected with people. So a hundred percent, we really do need it, but also a hundred percent, we're going to see a lot of people wanting to distance. It will change. I'm craving it. I mean, I haven't shook someone's hand other than my, touch my own family's hands in like six weeks. It's, it's, yeah. it's very, and again, from a, uh, cause you're a, you're a jujiterio and uh, Jules as well. And myself, just that, that contact of doing jujitsu, it's, it's impossible to do it without having that contact. So it's, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested to see where it's going to go. What will you take away from this, Emily? From COVID-19? Mm. Um, I will take away a certain amount of adaptability. I think a lot of people are taking away a certain amount of adaptability. So when you're thrown into a situation that's difficult or challenging, and this goes for life in general, it gives you an opportunity to learn and grow. So I've definitely learned and grown throughout COVID and um, by being challenged in different aspects. So there will be a lot of adaptability. Um, and I think I'm also taking uh, away... For, for the first part of COVID, I actually went quite internally and I, I didn't do a lot um, externally to myself. I was quite quiet. And I used that time to reflect on things that I want to do with my life and move myself forward within my career. So I'm taking a new kind of direction in my career at the back of um, COVID in the sense that I'm now stepping into more of a teaching role. I'll still be seeing people one-on-one, but I really feel called to teach the collective what I do because I want it to help in a greater capacity than what I can do just one-on-one after another. So that's probably the biggest thing I'm taking out of COVID. That'll be, um, and that's the thing, and I'll, like we spoke about it prior, it's going to be like essentially for you that shift where you go, I can now do this as well, or I can, like you're talking about your photography and jujitsu, you're just gonna, and again, I I get this a lot from people, we're just gonna maybe relish in those things a little bit more and go, maybe I need to like, you know, use this situation even more and not sweat the small stuff and take on the big things and give it a go. I think we're all going to take away a, a deeper sense of gratitude for everyday things and everyday luxuries, aren't we? Because we've had them taken away from us. So, But have you missed them? Some of the things, absolutely. Other things, not as much. So it's been quite an interesting... Um, what would you say you've missed the most? Human connection. Absolutely yeah. human connection. And uh, the freedom to move about my you know surroundings so for you internal things because i've interviewed other people or spoken to other people and it's like i just want to go to the pub and have a steak oh i definitely want to do those things too (laughs) (laughs) but again it's going to the pub and having a steak and having a drink with a big group of friends that i hold very dear to me so it's it's again it's this may seem that but i'm really doing it because i get to do this that's a hundred percent correct. Like how many people, when they answer that question saying, I can't wait to go to the pub, are wanting to go to the pub because they just want to drink beer because they can drink beer at home, right? Mm-hmm. People go to the pub to drink a beer because they want the social interaction. They want to be out of their house, out of their surroundings. So it's, it is an intrinsic thing that's happening in an intrinsic, extrinsic way. No, exactly. I totally agree. Look, uh, Emily Shine, thank you so much. Thank you for, um, rearranging the times and everything i uh, i really appreciate it i hope uh you uh when this is all over continue to flourish as you will um, thank you if somebody wants to get in touch with you how would they do that easiest way to access all of my information my socials and everything else is just to go to emilyshine.com it'll all be on there, there you go. <laughs> And nice Emily, and easy to remember. Emily is spelled the correct way, not like Kyle. Kyle's not spelled. Yeah, correct. no, E M I L Y <laughs> and shine like S H I N E. Perfect. And uh, as I said, a, a perfect surname to have. <laughs> um, guys, uh, if you like what you've heard and you want to hear more, just go to my uh, YouTube channel. Um, and also on there, you will see links to all my socials, uh, kylereva.com.au. The website's getting a little bit of a revamp at the moment, so um, it'll look even better soon. But uh, that's about all we have time for. Emily, thank you awesome. very much. When this is all over, um, I'll have to catch up to have a roll with Jules, and uh, you can bring your gear along, champion, and let's let's see how we go. 
Now that's making me nervous. I'm <laughs> <laughs> making me nervous. <laughs> I am so out of shape, it's not funny. <laughs> I can guarantee I'm worse. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been Thank a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And we it's will see lovely. you soon. Awesome.